is beautiful to see little kids performing. And a lot of them, this will be their one chance in the world because maybe they're not greatly talented, but it totally doesn't matter. They're on stage, they're being a, whether they're being a pirate or um, a crab, whatever they're being, they feel validated and creative and their parents are in the audience. And we think it's the perfect step toward the literacy component that we're so eager to, you know, get going with kids with the books. And it seems that theater and and book reading are very interrelated because of the imagination. And you have to read to learn your lines and you you get into the words. So it's a good, they're good companions for each other. This is the Growing Readers Podcast. Today, pages come to life and adventures unfold on the grand stage. I have the pleasure of introducing two extraordinary individuals who have sprinkled magic into the hearts of millions through the beloved Magic Treehouse series. Our guests are the award-winning author behind the best-selling Magic Treehouse books, Mary Pope Osborne, and her talented husband, playwright and author, Will Osborne. Together, they are thrilled to announce the exciting launch of Magic Treehouse On Stage, which is a website tailored for professional theaters, youth theaters, schools, and of course, the devoted fans of Magic Treehouse. The journey of Magic Treehouse On Stage began in 2007 with the adaptation of Christmas in Camelot. Will Osborne, alongside composer Randy Quartz, brought Jack and Annie's captivating story from the pages of the books to the dazzling lights of a stage, creating a full-scale, Broadway-style musical adventure that resonated with families across the nation. The success of Magic Treehouse the Musical marked the beginning of a theatrical journey that spanned U.S. cities and even reached audiences in Germany. Their new website, Magic Treehouse on Stage, offers an exclusive behind-the-scenes look into the magic-making process featuring original music samples, photos from past productions, character breakdowns, and scripts. You can even get to know the creative minds behind the curtain, including the Osbournes, composer Randy Quartz, and the award-winning playwright Jenny Laird. And the magic doesn't end there. The Magic Treehouse universe continues to expand its magical horizons with eight other musical adaptations, each offering a unique and enchanting experience. For classrooms and non-professional groups, there are also four productions available for licensing through Music Theatre International's Broadway Junior Collection of musicals, making the magic accessible to everyone. So joining us today are not only creators but also passionate advocates for children's literacy. Mary Pope Osborne, with over 100 books to her name, has dedicated herself to fostering a love of reading among children globally. Her contributions through the Classroom Adventures Gifts of Books Literacy Program have put over 1.2 million books into the hands of children in need. Will Osborne, a seasoned playwright and director, has been a driving force in the world of professional theatre for five decades. His work, including collaborations with Mary and his solo ventures, has left an indelible mark on the stage and in the hearts of young readers. Together, Mary and Will Osborne have transformed the literary landscape, bringing joy and wonder to readers around the world. So I'm glad that we can be together today as we explore the wonders of Magic Treehouse on stage. One summer day in Frog Creek, Pennsylvania, a mysterious treehouse appeared in the woods. On a day just like any other, in the woods not very far from home as they walked a sister and brother but that day what they said didn't matter that day in the woods they weren't alone that day at the top of a ladder Found a magic place where wishes can come true. How far can you see? This time. 
Hi, Mary and Will. Welcome to the Growing Readers podcast. Thank Hi, you. Bianca. It's great to be nice here. to be here. <laughs> it's such an honor. I mean, I, I have three kids. Anyone who's listened to my uh, podcast before knows I talk about my kids on and off and uh, all of them have read uh, the Magic Treehouse series. So I'm really excited Great. to focus our chat today on the adaptations of the Magic Treehouse series into stage musicals and the launch of your new Magic Treehouse on stage website. But before we go there, I thought we could do a couple of icebreaker questions. How does that sound? Great. Sounds good. Sure. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I mean, this is a this is a fun one. I've noticed that a lot of authors that come on the show have pets at home, a lot of cats and dogs. Do you have any pets at home? Oh, yes. Yes, we have a, a little Yorkie and a little rescue mix and they rule our house. In fact, they're away from us now back in the back of the house because they would take over this whole podcast. They think uh, that we work for them and they they have no respect, <laughs> but they are a delight. Yeah, we're not big on discipline and training, but yeah. we're really big on love. We just love them like crazy. Yeah, I hear you on that. My dog yeah. is also in a, a separate place from me right now, or she too <laughs> would try to steal the show. Um, uh, yeah. What is it that you love about dogs so much? Well, I think because we're both in the arts and imaginative, we impose a lot of character on them. And so we interpret what they're doing as if they are book characters or, or f film characters, and it makes it so funny. Our first dog we had was just a one female terrier, and we had her for, what, 16 years? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, then we wound up with two of the same breed, and we realized that having two, they become a comedy show. They're hilarious together. So it's not just having a companion. It's about having constant entertainment. And so now for a while we had three and now we have uh, two. We have Yeah. And the way two. they relate to each good. other just cracks us up. Yeah. And uh, it seems like the more you impose character on them, the more they live up to their part. <laughs> so we, we always talk about the dogs. It's really yeah. nutty. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, is there anything that you both do daily that you think would be the most relatable or even surprising to listeners? Well, uh, uh, well, maybe I'm also a musician, so I practice guitar daily and um, we both read a lot. That shouldn't yeah. be surprising yeah. to anybody, but we both love to read and, and almost always have a book or two or three going and, the, and particularly Mary, the stack of books beside on her bed, her side of the bed, the bedside table is about to reach the ceiling. It's it's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. I, I read a lot of things at the same time. I mean, I'll pick up this book and then 10 minutes later, I'll pick up that book and then another book. And that's the way I do research too for the Magic Treehouse is I get a great library on my table and lots of uh, pages from the internet and a lot of sources. And I take a little bit from everything and I'm totally focused and somehow they all blend together to give me um, a kind of sense of the place and, and what I need to say about it. So it's, I'm, a, I'm really a very eclectic reader, but I'd have tons of books going all the time. I love it. Well, then if you uh, will describe your big large stack that you have, so obviously you can't name them all. What's the first title that jumps into your mind? Either something that you're reading right now, or maybe you just finished. Oh, good question. I'm reading. Uh, I'm rereading Anna Karen and uh, Karenia from Tolstoy. There's a new translation, so I have that beside the bed, and I have a uh, book about Tolstoy's uh, biography beside the bed. But that's there along with. Um, the uh, history of the Middle East and uh, several books of philosophy and several books of painting and arts. The Sacred and Art is one of my books I'm reading now. So it's just such a varied collection. I don't uh, really read uh, that much popular fiction. I really love old, old writing of the best. Well, Will, since you have a theater background and, mm -hmm. and music and acting, what kind of role has reading and literature played in your life or or how do you think it inspired you to sort of become who you came as an adult? 
When I was a kid, I, I read a lot. And if I was reading a Tarzan book or a, a, a book of uh, uh, Frank Baum, the, the Wizard of Oz, and the extended series that came from that, I would then go out in the woods and make up imaginary games, almost always by myself. And, you know, a stick would become a sword, a tree would become, you know, a, a knight that I was battling or whatever. And I always pick, and I also always, even as a kid, loved movies and seeing acting. And I, I knew it was acting. I didn't make them, I knew I wasn't watching real life, but I was so fascinated by the process of acting, even as a, a young kid, that uh, it wasn't until I was in college that I actually started acting. And um, that that has... That's played a huge part in my writing. I sort of transitioned from being an actor to a writer some years back. And I think I learned as much about writing from being an actor all those years as I would have had I gotten a degree in creative fiction you know, from some university somewhere. Just sort of living in the words of great writers, playwrights, Shakespeare, Chekhov, Tennessee Williams, just does something to the way you hear language. And I think that's been hugely important to me, both as a a writer of fiction, nonfiction, and lyrics as a lyricist. There's a rhythm to language that I'm just fascinated by. What about you, Mary? Any childhood memory in which you think established you as a reader, or did did you not consider yourself a reader until you were an adult? Only through my imagination. I was also interested in theater growing up. And I was always making up characters and telling stories, but out loud and acting them out. I was an army brat, so I traveled a lot and was always reinventing myself everywhere we moved to. And it was really not until I became a young adult and and fell in love with Will that I he encouraged me to write and I started writing. We were living in New York City then and I'd go up to the rooftop and of our old tenement building and take a tablet in a director's chair and start writing my first stories. So it came right out of my imaginative impulses growing up, I think. And theater played a big role in my life. Well, let's go back in time a little bit here. So, Mary, if you could take us back to the beginning of the Magic Treehouse series. And I I just would love to know how it all got started for you. Like, how, how did the first story in that magic treehouse come to you? And then the second part of that question is, did you ever imagine from that first story the huge success that the magic treehouse would have? Mm-hmm. No, uh, I I had written a number of books already uh, in the 80s, and Random House called me in and said, would you like to do a series for younger readers? And I didn't really want to do the same thing over and over in a series because I'd always written about um, history and mythology and young adult novels. And I, I was very, as in my reading taste, I was very eclectic in my writing taste. Um, but then I thought if I did time travel... I could do the series because I could go to a different place in every book, but I didn't know how I'd get the kids back in time. And I tried a magic cellar, magic whistles, a magic artist studio, a magic um, museum. All those were full manuscripts that didn't work out. And I was about to give up that project of time travel for younger readers. And Will and I had a cabin in Pennsylvania and we were walking in the woods and we saw an old tree house. And that was a year into me exploring the topic. And instantly it just sort of fell into place, us talking about it. And then um, by the next day, I was off and running with the magic tree house. And no, I was just going to do four books and then get back to my other work. But after four books, something happened that had never happened before. I started getting letters, lots of letters from teachers and parents and kids, wonderful letters telling me the books that inspired kids to read or kids sending me their ideas for what I should write about, their pictures and their own writing. And I signed up to do four more and then four more. And then suddenly that's all I was doing. It was just so joyful. And meeting all the readers was just icing on the cake. (laughs) That's fantastic. I think what's really fun. So uh, with this podcast, everybody's like, who's your audience? Pick an audience that you're speaking to. And the thing is with this podcast is that we have so many different kinds of listeners. We have families listening in their cars. We have aspiring authors. 
we have published authors, we have industry people, you know, so I feel like what you said is so relevant to everybody in that you actually, it took you a while to figure out how to come to this project. And because you stuck with it and you didn't end up giving up on it is how we got to where we are. So thank you for sharing that it wasn't so easy to come up with the the, the series in the first place. Well, I tell young readers uh, that sometimes the uh, simplest ideas are the hardest ones to find. Uh, and simple is not easy. So not only is it not easy to get a simple idea that has life in it and works, but you have to s- express that in a more s- simpler way than you would for older readers. And then, then comes the work of refining it. Even, yeah. uh, even after 30 years, the, any of her books go through six, seven, eight revisions just based on my input to start with. And then it gets passed on to editors and we go through that. And uh, it's never done until the very, very, very last minute. And there've been so many times when she's worked on a book and it's great, it's fine, it's wonderful, but there's something that's not quite right. And it's about to go to the the printer. I mean, it's just on the verge of getting being out of our hands forever. And something will strike one of us. It's like, oh, oh, I know what's missing in this last scene. And then yeah. quick, 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 they'll, you know, just a few paragraphs will make the whole book sparkle. Yeah, Will and I have a great chemistry. Uh, he's worked with me on all my books and probably not counting Treehouse, I have 40 more books. And it's he's my first editor for everything. And then I always believe if he sanctions something, I know when to stop. And that's really important for for writers. You have to know when not to, when to leave it alone. And he helps me with that too, as as well does my Random House editor. So then I want to know, and I I think I know the answer to this, but who suggested that the books be turned into a musical? I'm going to guess it was Will. Pretty much, we uh, I had done a musical with a, a, a wonderful composer who's now one of our closest friends. Way, way back in 2000. Oh, it's probably early. 90, 92-ish. Yeah, yeah 93. And um, then it was done off-Broadway. And then every time we got together for years after that, we kept saying, oh, geez, we'd run into each other at openings and stuff. And uh, we said, oh, we got to get together again. we got to do something, do something. So finally, we settled down to work on a play that was going to be a historical, a fictionalized piece of history about a, 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 the Cardiff giant. And it was fun. It was a fun P.T. Barnum was in it. And but we were having some trouble with it. And Mary said, this would probably be great. But, you know, if you did Magic Treehouse, you'll have a built in audience. You have a framework you can pick up from the books. And the books are very theatrical. There are lots of possibilities for wonderful staging of things. And so we took about half a second to think and said, okay, toss the other uh, piece away and then went through. Then the process was finding which book, how do we get the backstory? How do we get everything together? So our first criterion was what is the book with the most theatrical possibilities? And we chose Christmas in Camelot because there's a huge banquet. There's a a, a hero's journey to the other world. There's uh, a magical spells. There are, there are dragons. And, they're all, and we just saw this is so much in this that we could put on stage that we actually started writing the musical and recorded a cast album before it was ever staged because we wanted to make sure that the, the uh, music was right. Then we did a pilot production, uh, first production at a theater in Torrington, Connecticut. And it went so well, we decided, well, we'll let's send this on tour. Let's do it next year. Let's take a year to refine everything we know so far. And the next year, we used the same theater and put together a touring production that went to 54 cities and had just spectacular effects. We had puppets that were two stories high that were created by one of uh, Jim Henson's associates. We had a fabulous stage set with a big burbling golden cauldron full of magical water and castles. And it was just a a magnificent show. And it was not a particularly good time to be on the road because the recession was happening and elections were happening. And so uh, we came back after the year and put everything in storage and then realized that this was so much fun and people seemed to enjoy it so much that this was not the only book that we could adapt and we could do books that would be more appropriate for children to perform 
We could do books that were simpler for communities to stage. And that's how the whole our whole library now of Magic Treehouse musicals was born. And do you want to add anything there, Mary? Well, my part in all of this is to just go near the end and see it. And <laughs> it's always blows my mind. It's always better than my book, frankly. And I just feel like they kept but Randy Quartz and then Jenny Laird, who's his wife and also a professional playwright, the three of them just take the ball and run with it all the way down the field. And by the time I see the show, I'm in tears. It's just such a perfect soul and heart of the books. And that's what I cared about most is that they keep the the life lessons going in the books without being didactic, but just keep it all um, with a beautiful kind of uplifting feeling and that's what they've done for all the musicals. So, and you get bits and pieces along I the get, way. I get, I get. Well, now and then they'll hear a song. Spa. Yeah, they share songs with me, but I can't picture it all together until I see the whole thing running. But the songs are always a thrill, and you can isolate any of the songs from the shows. There's about a hundred songs they've done now for all these shows collectively. That um, I think any one of them stands alone as just inspiring and wonderful for children. <laughs> TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. Well, so now you you have this new website, which is Magic Treehouse on Stage. And I'll mm-hmm. say the URL for our listeners, which is mthonstage.com. And the new site is a hub that encompasses the full scope of the Magic Treehouse Theater Program. So do you want to talk us through what can be found on the website and how have you made the musicals accessible for professional theaters, youth theaters, schools, parents, and of course, our Magic Treehouse fans? <laughs> okay. Um, basically, the musicals are divided into two categories. Uh, the first is called, we call it Theater for Young Audiences. And they're designed for professional actors to perform for families and children. And they're done in regional theaters and on tour and that sort of thing. There are five of those. And then there are four what you might call kids theater. It's called, uh, we work through an organization called Music Theater International for those. And they're licensed to schools, to community theater groups, and they're designed primarily for kids to perform for other kids and their families. And the, the scripts are usually... Uh, for those are have much bigger casts so that an entire classroom can participate in the performances. So if there's an oak tree, it can be like Billy the Oak. So every kid has a, a role to play. The kids. Uh, yeah. And those come, uh, are licensed, as I said, through Music Theater International. And they come with a show kit that includes backing tracks for all the music, director's guide, full scripts, and uh, st- schools will generally license them with the kit. So it's sort of theater in a box. And even for directors who have never worked in theater before, it's accessible. It's possible to do. And then the uh, the theater for young audiences are, the scripts are a little more sophisticated. Uh, they're longer. They're theater for the... Um, sorry, the, the kids' theater, they're about half an hour. The theater for young audiences is about 40, 50 minutes to an hour long. So they're longer. If a theater wants to have an intermission, there's a we can suggest where that can happen. And again, they're uh, generally for professional actors, even in a, a community situation, to perform for families and children. And so I have to ask, in terms of all of the plays, which one has been the most popular? Or it just kind of depends. It, it kind of depends. Probably of the uh, theater for kids, it's Dinosaurs Before Dark, which was the first book in the series. And, you know, kids are always going to love dinosaurs. Well, look them up in the book, Jack. Long ago, at the edge of day, dinosaurs.
We have a, one musical that we did based on A Good Night for Ghosts, which was the Louis Armstrong, A Magic Treehouse book. And that's been very popular. The music for that was composed by Alan Toussaint, who some of your listeners will recognize. He uh, just died a few years ago. He's a legendary New Orleans composer, and we were just blessed to have him for this particular style of music. It was just great. And then we have a, a hip-hop musical based on Showtime with Shakespeare, which is called Showtime, Showtime with Shakespeare. With Shakespeare. It's, based on a- it's, it's based on Stage Fright on a Summer Night, which is the Magic Trias <laughs> title. And that was really fun. That was an idea that Randy came up with. Randy Quartz, our composer friend. What happens if you take Shakespearean language and adapt it to a hip-hop beat and take a Shakespearean, in this case, it's Midsummer Night's Dream, and try to tell that story in the context of the play with hip-hop music? Then to the illustrious bard of Avon, Fly this pair of good siblings. Let the play begin. William Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, he wrote the plays that made you wanna come here. He wrote the plays that you all want to see. William Shakespeare, yo, that's me. Said I wrote Troilus and Cressida, Hamlet, you forget, Romeo and Juliet, Cymbeline and the Winter's Tale, and where we go from here, we'll all swear that ends well, Twelfth Night, King Lear, we can go on for days, did anybody here see the Scottish play, and let us not forget our Midsummer Night's Dream, well as you like it, we're just building up steam, William Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, he wrote the plays that made you wanna come here, he wrote the plays, man, he really had the knack. Everywhere that you never want to be So tell us everything Or was it much ado about nothing We saw dinosaurs And then our most recent one Which I think we're very proud of Is a book based on uh, A Big Day for Baseball Which is the story of Jackie Robinson's First day in the major leagues in 1947 And the music for that Mixes period music Like big band swing a little bit of gospel, and it's it's just a wonderful story. It premiered in Orlando, Florida, Orlando Shakespeare Theater last year, and Randy and I flew down to see it, and uh, couldn't have been, I, actually it wasn't Randy, it was our uh, business manager, Cindy Mill, flew down to see it, and just couldn't have been more pleased, and so that one's now available for licensing to other theaters. There's a great Christmas show called um, A Ghost Tale for That's Mr. True. Dickens, in which Jack and Annie give, my characters, give uh, Charles Dickens the idea for a Christmas carol, and they kind of act out Dickens's own past, present, and future, and it's done with violence violin music and it's just a wonderful pre-Christmas show before children really know about the Christmas carol and they go well together. And the great thing about Randy is that as a composer, he finds a sound that's appropriate to the period for every singer and the show, the whole feeling of the show. So there was sort of a, a Victorian feel to the music in the Dickens show. There's, I mean, hip hop was a, a step away, although there's quite a bit of Elizabethan there are harpsichords and stuff that lead us into the hip hop. And then, for, like I said, for Jackie Robinson, it's all period music from the feels like music from the 40s. And the Pirates uh, musical oh. <laughs> is yeah. a very Caribbean music with, you know, different creatures right. on the beach and uh, getting ready to be captured by the pirates. And sea shanties, and yeah. songs about parrots and sharks. I think they have a good time.
they have a good time uh, in the same way I do of uh, visiting these other worlds and then you just live in that world completely before you move on to another one. <laughs> yeah, I love I love that you've brought it to stage. It's like stage is just that whole next thing, the whole sensory experience of the music yeah. and the lighting. And I mean, just magical. It's beautiful to see little kids performing. And a lot of them, this will be their one chance in the world because maybe they're not greatly talented, but it totally doesn't matter. They're on stage, they're being a, whether they're being a pirate or um, a crab, whatever they're being, they feel validated and creative and their parents are in the audience. And we think it's the perfect step toward the literacy component that we're so eager to, you know, get going with kids with the books. And it seems that theater and and book reading are very interrelated because of the imagination. And you have to read to learn your lines and you, you get into the words. So it's a good, they're good companions for each other. And yeah, we I, love, love, I was going to say, we love watching kids watching this show's come to life on stage. This is kid so audiences lame. are so respectful as they watch other kids. They you could hear a pin drop and then they clap and scream and <laughs> in all the right places. <laughs> I love it. That all the right places is important. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Mary, I'm gonna read some words that you've shared before. So quote, live theater stimulates children's imaginations in ways nothing else can. And when the performance features characters kids know and love from a book, the connections they make are truly magical, unquote. Yeah. So what has been the best part of seeing your stories come to life on stage? Is it seeing the kids reaction? Is it is it being able to foster this greater love of literacy skills? Like what like what is it for you that has been the best part of seeing them come to life? Well, one wonderful part of it is the ensemble work of a group. So all the kids are respectful, uh, not only in the audience, but on the stage with each other. And and there's a discipline to that. And there's a discipline to learning to read. And there's when you apply yourself in the arts, you're moving beyond where you were. You know, you grow. And so you see children on the stage just becoming older, becoming more serious, becoming more uh, adventurous, the same way you do when a child starts reading a whole book. And so the, it's something very subtle, but it's very important for development. And I don't mean that as an educator, because I really don't have that background. I'm strictly in the arts. And, and that's why I feel that I have a passion that hopefully is not to quote educational, you know, it's meant to just envelop the child with joy. And, and not with any sense of, um, you know, that they have to do it as an assignment. It's for, it's for the sake of play, which is real important and which children don't get enough of now. I don't think the way we did outside and alone where you get to invent a, a reality. It's a cliche in theater to ask, why do you think they call it a play? Yeah. <laughs> because it's play. It's just <laughs> at, at its best. Theater is play. Yeah. Full of joy. I also, for me, I think we talk a lot about with reading, with reading books that it offers experiences. It it opens up discussions on topics that maybe you haven't heard of before. It can teach you about history and past and lessons we can learn from mistakes and and you know all of that. And I feel I feel as though it can help us process emotions. Mm -hmm. As somebody who did experience some um, theater classes and acting classes as as a kid too. I think what stage and and theater and acting brings to that next level is in the in the books or if you're reading a script, you're you're maybe touching it and opening up on discussions and thinking about it when you're actually doing the play and you're playing with it, you're getting that opportunity to play with emotions and experience the emotions maybe on a, a more physical level than internally. So I love the two working together and kids getting to read the books and hopefully getting to step into those characters and actually live those characters, even if it's for 30 minutes or an hour. Yeah, yeah I, that's our, our dream. I'd say that's perfect. So I have to imagine that creating such a successful brand, uh, that it has taken a village. So you've touched on a few of your collaborators, but I would love it if you would talk uh, about some Magic Treehouse team members and what they have helped bring to the Magic Treehouse brand and to its success now. 
Well, I started out with a wonderful team at Random House, a wonderful editor, Mallory Lohr, and art director and artist, Sal Murdaka. We were a team for a solid uh, 20, 25 years. But then Will came up with the idea before the plays of doing nonfiction books that are companions to the fiction so kids could learn more about all these places Jack and Annie go. So he became a major player on the team and he wrote eight of those and then he left to create a Magic Treehouse Planetarium show for the University of North Carolina. And my sister joined the team and she wrote another 30, 40 of the nonfiction books and some activity books. And then Randy and Jenny, Randy Quartz and Jenny Laird, a married couple, came aboard our two closest friends to work with Will on the musicals. So they're part of the team. And we have a wonderful person who manages all of these components and Cindy Mill, who's our general manager. And there just seems to be a team that never... Nobody's driven by an ego. It, it's becomes the thing is the the treehouse world is all we care about. So we're all eager to have input into that and to to adjust that. But at the same time, everyone stays in their own lanes. So everybody has their project that they are feeling proud of. And. And, and now Jenny is doing the graphic. Oh novels. yes, and Jenny is now doing uh, adapting my books into graphic novels with a wonderful team of uh, twin sisters who live in Washington State, and Kelly and uh, Nicole Matthews, and they have created great, wonderful art of that. And then we, another artist has come aboard for um, the series. A A G. Is it A G Ford? Is, Yes, 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 of course yes. it is. I love AD for that work. work. Yeah, a wonderful <laughs> job. And uh, so we we and my agent has been the same oh, for, for yeah. forever, yeah. Gail Hockman. And now I have a new editor, uh, who was Mallory Laura's assistant for many years, uh, Jenna Lettuce. So we have this. It's a few movable parts, but basically the whole train has been running on the same track for they're over now 31 years and uh it's going to keep running for a while that's fantastic i think i think too what you said is with collaboration is also knowing like that you all stay in your lane like you all know and i think that's part of expanding and growing is that knowing our own limitations and when it's great to share ideas and to expand and and know what everybody's strengths are and so uh, i love that you have that and that's obviously aided in the success of you know, magic treehouse world. Yeah, I think so. There's an old uh, storyteller adage I read years and years ago, and I certainly use it with the the writing team. And I mean, the musical team and the graphics is take my story and make it better. And I've been so great, you know, amazingly blessed to have people do that. So I don't feel like anything's ever gone astray. And it's probably why we haven't done film and television and uh, a lot of media, because we like doing this ourselves, (laughs) you know, and until we really get to be a big part of uh, that world, we wouldn't do it, I don't think. Right. Well, I'm going to read a quote that I don't know. It was either Mary or Will. You shared it with me ahead of our conversation uh, via email. And it's from the Christmas in Camelot musical adaptation after Jack thanks Annie for rescuing him from being trapped forever in a Celtic fairy dance. She says, that's OK. You've rescued me lots of times. And besides, none of this would be much fun if we were doing it by ourselves. So I wondered, after I read that quote, if it resonates with you because it's how you feel about working together. Oh, uh, indeed. Oh, I, absolutely. Will had T-shirts made for the entire cast and crew of the big musical we put on the road of Christmas and Camelot. And all the T-shirts said, none of this would be any fun if we were doing it by ourselves. Yeah. So it's been our theme, I think. And it's attracted really wonderful people to the team. So, Mary, I understand that you have an amazing classroom program. And I just think that any teachers listening, any parents that could forward this along to the their, the teachers of their children, um, I think they need to know about it. Will you will you share a little bit about it? Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, If you go to Magic Treehouse Classroom Adventures, uh, I started this 10, 
12 years ago. It's a website for teachers to use when they use the books in the classroom. It's got lesson plans for every single book, and it has reading levels and curriculum tie-ins and letters from teachers giving each other ideas that they've used in the classroom. And for Title I schools, they have an opportunity to apply for a grant for for, um, free Magic Treehouse books. And it's a very simple process. It's just filling out one page. So um, I hope we consider it a gift to the teachers who've been so important to the series all these years. Well, before we go, I'm going to ask you each this question, and I'm going to start with you, Will. What is the most important point that you would like the Growing Readers listeners to take away from our conversation today? And feel free to make an awkward pause. That is totally fine. (laughs) (laughs) I would say, don't be afraid to try something new. Working with kids and theater, everybody talks about stage fright. And there's a performance energy and a joy in performing that can completely obliterate stage fright once you're there and doing it. So if you're at, if you have the opportunity to participate in some theatrical endeavor, say yes before you even think about it. And then just dive in with both feet and just do it with joy and commitment and a feeling for your your collaborators, whether they're the, the director or your fellow performers, and just let yourself have a ball. Mary, how about you? One important well, thing. I think that I always emphasize to kids, um, to, to all ages, to um, do the work, rewrite, 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 practice, rehearse, 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 but don't lose a sense of fun. And always remember that creating art is fun. It's play, as Will said earlier. And if you lose that sense of fun and play, step back. Take a pause. Take a break. Don't make it dreadful or or horrible for yourself. Make it joyful, but do the work. It's a combination of discipline and absolutely letting go and being happy. Well, Will, Mary, thank you so much for spending time with me, spending time with our listeners today. And a pleasure. I think just as a as a parent, not even as I would call myself a literacy advocate, but just as a parent, thank you for creating art in your books, in your plays, and just in a way that is fun and accessible and just encourages our kids to love learning and and love playing, as you said. So thank you. Thank you very much, Bianca. It's nice to meet you. Yeah. And I would encourage anybody, even if they're not a producer or director, or even particularly interested in theater, to check out the website because it's so much fun. It's colorful. There are pictures from all the shows. There are song samples from all the shows. And if you're a Magic Treehouse fan in particular, just wander through the website. There's a lot to see and you can really have a good time, I think. Absolutely. And that link is going to be in our show notes, too. So anybody listening can just, you know, toggle into those show notes and click right over. So thanks for sharing that, Will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on this quest for growing readers. Be sure to check out our show notes for more information about Mary Pope Osborne, Will Osborne and Magic Treehouse on stage www.mthonstage.com. And remember, if you love listening to the Growing Readers podcast, you can hear it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you enjoy listening. Be sure to follow and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform to get new episodes as soon as they launch. If you're enjoying our book chats, please leave us a review. And while you're at it, grab your phone and text a friend you know who would love to listen to this episode. The Growing Readers Podcast is a production of the Children's Book Review. To find more books just like the Magic Treehouse series, I hope you'll visit us at thechildrensbookreview.com.